Even if you're not American, chances are that you've heard of the Ku Klux Klan, better known as the KKK before. The KKK is one of the oldest and most infamous white supremacist hate groups in the world and is pretty much synonymous with racism. Now, you don't become the poster child for racism without having at least a few, ahem, unsavory people in your group. And the KKK has certainly had its fair share of members who are not just hateful, but downright deadly. Who are the eight deadliest KK members? Keep watching to find out. David Duke. So this is David Duke, and fun fact, he hates pretty much everyone. I mean, you don't exactly become the Grand Wizard of the KK if you aren't at least a little bit hateful, but Duke has pretty much made hate his life's mission, and it all started from when he was young. Duke was born in 1950 in Tulsa, Oklahoma, and first became passionate about segregation when he was in the eighth grade. By the end of high school, he was a Klan member. He'd already been reading white supremacist books in high school, but when he was in college, he formed a white students group and was known to walk about in a Nazi costume. Sheesh. Post-college, he continued his white supremacist activities and in 1974 founded the Knights of the Ku Klux Klan. At just 26, he had become the youngest ever Grand Wizard of the KKK, which is sort of an accomplishment. During the six years that he served as Grand Wizard, he famously pushed for some equality by allowing women and Catholics to join. Yes, that is very ironic considering the KKK's entire mission statement, but that's a whole other thing. He left the KKK in 1980 and said it was because of its associations with violence, but some say it was because he had been selling membership information to the FBI. But if you thought his reign of terror would stop, you'd be wrong. He chose to pursue a career in politics, and it was quite something. He ran for a seat in the Louisiana State Senate in 1975 and 1979, but failed both times, but eventually scored the seat in 1989 and served till 1992 after he then ran for governor of Louisiana. This was around the time that he became a Republican, said he'd become a Christian, and denounced racism. Huh? A former Grand Wizard of the KKK denouncing racism? What gives? You see, his governorship campaign was taking a hit because of his activities so he denounced the clan to help his chances of winning. It didn't work and he still lost. Speaking of the clan, it turns out even they had issues with Duke, mostly due to money. Not only did he leave after being accused of selling clan secrets for money, but he was also accused of stealing money raised from rallies. Throughout his political career in the 90s, during which time he ran for US President, the US Senate, and the US Congress, he was accused of fundraising and then keeping the money. See a pattern here? After his failed political ambitions, Duke also dropped the act and went back to endorsing racist beliefs. And believe me, there were a lot of them. He spread hate towards African Americans and even published an autobiography with an anti-Semitic conspiracy theory. Duke ended the 90s by serving 15 months in jail for, you guessed it, defrauding his supporters and tax evasion. He since claimed that he was never guilty and that it was all a conspiracy from the government to silence him. Once he was out, he went back to his habits of spreading racist propaganda trying to enter public office and overall causing chaos. And the rise of the internet and social media, amazingly, allowed him to spread his message even more. He famously got sent out of Germany for trying to incite a far-right rally, endorsed Donald Trump for president twice, and got banned from Facebook, YouTube, and Twitter. And despite all of this, Duke continues to have supporters and followers from all over the world, from political figures to people on the internet who support his ideas. What makes David Duke so deadly is that he's shown that he'll throw anyone under the bus. He spent years spreading hate towards people of other ethnicities while stealing from his own supporters and inciting them to violence. If that's not deadly, I don't know what is. Robert Shelton. Lots of people leave all sorts of legacies behind when they die. Robert Shelton's legacy is that he united one of the most hateful groups in America in the mid-20th century. Born in 1929, Robert was a car tire salesman, worked in a factory, and even ran for police commissioner in Alabama at some point. This might seem like a fairly regular life, but when he wasn't being your everyday working man, husband, and father, he was knee-deep in KKK activities. He was so involved, in fact, that he was able to take advantage of a rift in the KKK and rise to become a leader in it. You see, the KKK's seventh grand Grand Wizard Eldon Edwards died in 1960 and was replaced by Roy Davis. And let's just say that Davis's time wasn't exactly united. There was constant infighting and several members, including Robert, broke away. But this didn't mean that he would give up his racist cause. Instead, he lured other members of the original KKK into his own group called the Alabama Knights of the Ku Klux Klan. The Alabama Knights then became the United Clans of America, UKA, and Robert became their Grand Wizard. Crazy enough, the United Clans of America were so successful that they outnumbered the original KKK. KKK, with 30,000 members strong. As you would imagine, having these many loyal supporters of a racist hate group was bound to lead to some trouble. Soon, the KKK was being investigated. Remember our first entry, David Duke, and how he was selling KKK membership info for money? Well, Robert wasn't about that life at all. In fact, he went to jail for a year because he wouldn't give up this information to the House Committee on Un-American Activities. After he came out, Robert was tied to several violent attacks by the KKK. There was a plot to attack black students during the integration of the University of 
of Alabama, where Robert paid the bail of dozens of armed racists. There was the bombing of the 16th Street Baptist Church in Birmingham, Alabama, where four black girls were killed. There was the murder of civil rights activist Viola Luzzo in 1965 and the attacks on NAACP officers' homes in the late 70s. Now, keep in mind that all of these attacks likely couldn't have taken place without Robert knowing about and approving them. Some even say that he orchestrated them himself, given that he was the head of the UKA and a violent racist man himself. But the case that brought the downfall of Robert's regime was the brutal lynching of Michael Donald, a 19-year-old African-American man in 1981. All of his killers, including a man named James Knowles, were members of the KK, and after being convicted, either died by execution or went to jail for life. Donald's mother, Beulah May Donald, then filed a civil suit against the United Knights and was awarded $7 million in damages in 1987. The only issue was that the organization didn't have $7 million to pay the settlement with, so Miss Donald was given the title and deed to their headquarters and whatever assets they owned. This judgment basically bankrupted the Knights and Robert retreated into seclusion. But if you thought he had changed his ways, think again. In 1994, he said that he still had the same beliefs, but that the organization was not the same. The Klan is my belief, my religion, but it won't work anymore. The Klan is gone, forever. He died of a heart attack in March 2003, and thankfully, the UKA have been disbanded for years. Thomas Robb. The thing about organizations like the KKK is that they are like a hydra head. One gets cut off and another comes in its place. In some way, you can think of Robert Shelton as the original hydra head and Thomas Robb as the one who came after. But before that, let's look at his early life. Thomas was born in 1946 in Detroit, but was raised in Tucson, Arizona. He eventually rose to prominence in 1989 after Robert Shelton stepped down from his position as Grand Wizard. After the lawsuit that basically bankrupted the UKA, Thomas was determined to make the organization more modern and palatable in a fast change. America. He renamed them the Knights Party, and rather than calling himself the Grand Wizard, he used the title National Director. Thomas also got rid of the weird initiation rites from the Knights of Old, and instead allowed people to sign up through mail forms. This did not go down well with older clan members, but Thomas was determined to make the clan less clanny. He told reporters that the clan was more like a business club than a hate group, and that they were pretty much harmless. And while the clan and Thomas were getting a PR revamp, they were still doing the same things as before. In 1984, for example, Thomas and Louis B a man with known ties to domestic terrorism tried to enter the Southern Poverty Law Center's office barely a year after it had been torched by Klan members. And like David Duke, he also seems to have a penchant for stealing from his own members. He's been accused of stealing KKK funds, including a $20,000 donation. The fight over money led to yet another split in the Klan, and many of its members left to join other factions, some of which are more extreme. Since then, membership in the Knights Party has been dwindling, though Thomas still keeps his connections to other far-right groups. He's spoken at the World Congress of the Aryan Nations, is a contributor to the white supremacist website Stormfront, and in 1996 began peddling rumors of an incoming white genocide. Even in the 2000s, as he became a senior citizen, he continued to spew his hateful rhetoric. He described President Obama's election victory in 2008 as a race war between our people, who I see as the rightful owners and leaders of this great country, and their people, the blacks. When Donald Trump was running for president in 2016, he wrote a front-page endorsement of this presidency, that the Trump campaign did announced days before the election. And crazy enough, Thomas works as a pastor of the Christian Revival Center in Bergman, Arkansas. His sermons are typically, you guessed it, filled with racist messaging. On his own website, he says, We believe that the Anglo-Saxon, Germanic, Scandinavian, and kindred people are the people of the Bible. God separated and anointed Israel. Our people must resist the call of Satan, which the Bible says will come disguised as light and love, brotherly interracial love. In 2023, there were rumors that he had passed away at age 77, but these were debunked not long after. But you can bet that he's still dedicated to his lifelong passion for the Knights Party, where he is still national director to this day, Hiram Wesley Evans. To understand just how bad Hiram Wesley Evans was as a person, you need to understand just how powerful the KKK was at a point in American history and how he helped make this happen. You see, the KKK had been led by a man named William Joseph Simmons since 1915 and was the second Ku Klux Klan to exist. Now, Hiram had been born in Alabama and worked as a dentist in Dallas when he joined the KKK in 1920. One thing about Hiram, he was very dedicated to the KKK. So dedicated, in fact, that by 1921, barely a year in, he had become 
become the exalted Cyclops and was leading groups of clansmen to commit hate crimes. But in 1922, he was so powerful in the KKK that he helped remove William Joseph Simmons and took his place as Imperial Wizard. After what was basically a coup, Hiram began looking to make some changes in the KKK. He didn't just want to be an Imperial Wizard for the sake of it, he wanted to push his own agenda. Specifically, he wanted the clan to be more Protestant. He believed that Protestants were superior and should be in charge of Americans. In his book, The Clans Fight for Americanism, he wrote, these are the instincts of loyalty to the white race, to the traditions of America, and to the spirit of Protestantism, which has been an essential part of Americanism ever since the days of Roanoke and Plymouth Rock. They are condensed into the Klan slogan, Native, White, Protestant Supremacy. Just a quick rundown. He hated black people, Jewish people, communists, Catholics, and pretty much anyone who wasn't a white Protestant American man. Fortunately for him, this hateful rhetoric was quite popular at the time, and under his leadership, the Klan only grew. In 1923, the Klan was so big that Hiram presided over a gathering that was over 200,000 people strong on the 4th of July. Hiram also heavily concentrated on recruiting members from Illinois and Michigan, and it has been said that clan membership grew as large as 2.5 to 6 million people. Yikes. Keep in mind that one of the reasons why his tenure was so successful was because Hiram took an interest in politics. The clan was able to successfully endorse politicians into office and even recruited police officers. At the height of his tenure, Hiram was actually on the cover of Time magazine, but this was not to last. A few things led to the downfall of this period of the Klan. First, Hiram and D.C. Stevenson, who had helped in the coup against William Joseph Simmons, had a major falling out. They fought over money, took each other to court, and led two factions that threatened to split the KKK in half. It all came to a head when each accused the other of intimate misconduct. Stevenson was charged with kidnapping, assault, and murder of a woman, and was sent to jail for life. The trial and conviction left many Klan members disillusioned, and they left. Several other scandals, including different Klan factions suing Hiram and his revoking charters led to a major decline in membership in the 1920s. Then there was the Great Depression, and by the 1930s, membership had fallen to about 100,000. By 1939, Hiram resigned from the Klan and even denounced his previous anti-Catholic stance. Wow. He eventually found work in a construction company, but got into trouble for price fixing and was issued a $15,000 fine. But even in his later years, his beliefs did not mellow. He got involved in politics, endorsed, and criticized several candidates, and even got called an Imperial Bastard by Huey Long. He continued to speak at clan events as a former Imperial Wizard and had ties to them till his death in 1966. D.C. Stevenson. Remember D.C. Stevenson, who had the falling out with Hiram Wesley Evans? Well, he's on this list as well. Regardless of who was right in the Stevenson-Evans feud, D.C. Stevenson was far from a great person. He was born in 1891 in Texas, and from the start, lived a chaotic life. He got married, had a child, abandoned that family, married again, and then abandoned that family after his second child was born. Eventually, he found himself in Evansville, Indiana, working in the coal business, and soon took an interest in the KKK. He was recruited by Joseph M. Huffington, and immediately immediately rose through the ranks of the KK. He recruited thousands of new members, helped to start the Klan's weekly newspaper, Fiery Cross, and became an associate of Hiram Wesley Evans. When Evans launched a coup against William J. Simmons and took over as Imperial Wizard, D.C. Stevenson was one of his backers. As a reward for his loyalty, Evans made Stevenson the Grand Dragon of Indiana and made him the head of recruitment for the KKK in seven states. This was a pretty sweet gig, because new recruits had to pay a $25 initiation fee, and he got a cut of the fee. To put that in perspective, $25 in the 1920s is $382.11 in today's money. And given how many people were joining the KKK, you bet that D.C. Stevenson was making a lot of money. But the good times didn't last. The two fought over money, and Evans tried to strip Stevenson of his title. Stevenson, in response, refused to step down and started his own faction of the KKK without Evans. He even went as far as teaming up with William J. Simmons, whom he'd betrayed years before. He was going for power and believed that he was untouchable, one saying, I am the law in Indiana. His new KKK faction was actually pretty popular and powerful for a while, but this didn't last. In 1925, he went on trial for the kidnapping, assault, and murder of a woman named Madge Oberholzer. The details of the attack were gruesome. Stevenson had bitten her many times all over her body and the wounds had gotten infected. The ordeal was so bad that she attempted to kill herself and said in her dying breath that he was her attacker and had refused to release her. Keep in mind that Stephen had a history of trying to assault women before. He was also a prolific drunk, which is weird when you consider that he was a prohibitionist. 
This was partially what made the case so sensational. A man who had publicly promoted family values and no alcohol was revealed to be the opposite of all of those things. He was convicted of her abduction, assault, and murder, and sentenced to life imprisonment. The scandal saw not just Stevenson's downfall, but the KKK as well. Their reputation was thrashed in the media, and this led to a big decline in membership. He tried several times, but in 1956, he was released on the condition that he stay away from Indiana. By 1961, he was arrested for trying to assault a teenage girl, but was only given a fine. By 1966, he had died at the age of 71. Stephen was not just a leader in a hateful group, but also a violent man who was known for harming women and is perhaps one of the more depraved on the list. William J. Simmons. We've talked about some of the men who betrayed him, but what about William J. Simmons himself, the second imperial wizard of the KKK? Well, his life story is a bit of a doozy. He was born in 1880, and after serving in the Spanish-American War, he became a preacher for several churches. While recovering from a car accident in 1915, he decided that his next life project would be to revive the KKK after seeing the movie The Birth of a Nation. You see, there had been a clan before then, but they had been defunct for years, and Simmons decided, for some reason, that it should be revived. He later claimed that he had received a vision to restart the clan. The elements of this new KKK were based on things that had been done before and things he'd seen in the movies. He was able to convince some of his friends to become members, and on Thanksgiving Eve, November 25th, 1915, the group climbed a mountain and set a cross on fire. This was to symbolize the rebirth of the KKK in America, but burning crosses on mountains was not the only thing on the agenda. First, Simmons and his group went out to recruit new members and actually got several thousand over the next few years. Even as they accepted new members, not everyone white was welcome in the KKK. Just like his successor Hiram Wesley Evans, he didn't want any immigrants from Eastern Europe, Jewish people, or Catholics to join. Throughout the 1920s, he and his deputy Roy Alonzo Davis toured America giving talks, getting publicity, and getting new recruits. It was one of these recruits, Hiram Wesley Evans, who would replace Simmons as Imperial Wizard. Evans and several others convinced Simmons that if he stayed on as Imperial Wizard, it would hurt the KKK. So, he was tricked into agreeing to an arrangement where he would be the Emperor of the KKK but all the actual power would lay with Evans. Once Simmons realized that was happening, he tried to sue, but lost and was kicked out. Being shoved out of the KKK did nothing to quell Simmons' obsession with white supremacy. So what did he do? Why, he started another racist hate group, of course. He founded the Knights of the Flaming Sword and declared himself as the Imperial Wizard. He had the support of Roy Alonzo Davis, who left the KKK to join him. They then made it their mission to steal as many members from the old KKK as possible, and they were kind of successful at it. At its peak, the Knights of the Flaming Sword had about 60,000 members, but just like the KKK itself, the Knights of the Flaming Sword saw a massive decline in membership. After the public scandals, changes in leadership, and the shifting political tide in America happened, there just wasn't as much interest. Simmons never denounced his belief and died in Atlanta in 1945. What makes Simmons so evil is that almost everyone on this list can be traced back to him. The KKK had basically been extinct for years until he got the bright idea to bring it back. Then, its leadership fell into other hands and saw even more deadly men walk through it. Nathan Bedford Forrest if you're looking for someone who is very committed to the ideals of the KKK, you'll find few quite as devoted as Nathan Bedford Forrest. This man was a Confederate Army General and one of the earliest influential members of the KKK itself. But what led him to the KK in the first place? To answer that, we'll need to look at his life before the American Civil War. Forrest was born in 1821 in Tennessee and had a pretty normal upbringing for the time. He went to work for his uncle in 1841, and when his uncle was killed, he killed the men responsible. In the 1850s, he entered the business of the slave trade and was pretty successful at it. Historians believe that he sold thousands of enslaved black people, including a girl thought to be Frederick Douglass's daughter, and made a sizable fortune. Unsurprisingly, when the Civil War broke out, Forrest joined the side of the Confederacy. He was so passionate about the cause that he used his own money to buy equipment for his regiment, since they were short of supplies. If that doesn't convince you, consider this. Because he had so much money from selling enslaved people, he didn't need to enlist and could have been exempted. But like I said, he was really passionate passionate about the Confederacy, and it turns out he was quite good at combat. Even though he didn't have any previous military experience, he was promoted to general by the end of the war and got the nickname the Wizard of the Saddle for his skills. Now, if you've studied history, you know that the Confederates lost the Civil War. But what happened to Forrest after the war? In a nutshell, he went back to his old ways. Slavery was abolished, and he couldn't sell enslaved people, so he tried his hands at several businesses. They all failed, and so he bought a log cabin with his wife and grew crops. This time, he used convict labor 
instead of enslaved labor, but treated them just as badly. There was also his little hobby of joining the KKK. He was one of the KKK's first ever members, only a year after it was formed by former Confederate soldiers. He became the Grand Wizard and oversaw many of their activities, which involved harassing and even killing black voters during the 1868 presidential elections. These were most prominent in states like Ohio and Louisiana, where 1,000 black people were killed. The Klan had hoped to stop then-candidate Ulysses S. Grant from winning the election and targeted states with large black and Republican populations. Their efforts did not succeed, and Grant became the 18th President of the United States. In the last few years of his life, he left his position as Grand Wizard of the KKK and ordered members to burn their robes and disband the organization. No one listened to him naturally, and the KKK went on with their activities. He also gave speeches advocating for the rights of African Americans and was shunned by his former KKK associates. One of his last appearances before his death in 1877 was at a barbecue with many African American people. To this day, his legacy is tainted as one of the early members of one of the most hateful groups in the world. Frank Ancona. You'll probably have noticed that most of the entries on this list are from decades ago. That's because, thankfully, the KKK has way fewer members than it did in the past. But that doesn't mean that there aren't still many deadly people in their midst. One of these was Frank Ancona Jr., who was the imperial wizard of the traditionalist American Knights of the Ku Klux Klan. The group was very closely tied to the Klan of old and said on its website that it is a white patriotic Christian organization that bases its roots back to the Ku Klux Klan of the early 20th century. Our mission is to preserve our white culture and heritage, but also be relevant to the happenings going on in our republic today. It wasn't a very big faction, but had a few dozen members around the country. During his life, Frank was very active in Klan activities and infamously handed out pamphlets after the 2014 shooting of Michael Brown in Ferguson, Missouri. He encouraged police to use lethal force on protesters and went on TV to back up this opinion. Despite literally calling for the use of deadly force on unarmed protesters, Frank said to the media that the KKK wasn't a violent group. They want to put portray us as all toothless, redneck tobacco chewers. Some of us are. But some of us are college educated. I am a business owner. We just believe in promoting traditional American values. It was quite ironic then that his own life ended in a very violent way. And it wasn't while out doing clan duties. It was in his own home. His workplace had reported him missing in 2017 when he didn't show up for two days. His wife, Melissa Ancona, then went online to plead for his safe return. According to her, he'd gone out of state for a job. And once the police were notified and a search began for him, but then, she changed her story after his body was found in Belgrade, Missouri. She then said that her son, Paul Jinkerson Jr., had shot and killed him. The stories were already as bizarre as you can imagine, but there was yet another complication after she was taken into custody. From jail, she confessed that Frank had asked for a divorce and started sleeping with a 9mm handgun. She then decided to shoot him and hide the evidence. In a statement from prison, she said, I fired both shots that killed my husband, but claimed that she was under the influence. After killing Frank, she cleaned the walls of her bedroom and disposed of the body Body, but she was found out by the authorities. Frank's father also testified that his son had planned to leave his wife and this was a possible motive for her killing him. Following her confession, both she and her son were charged with first-degree murder, abandoning a corpse and tampering with evidence. Melissa was sentenced to life in prison for her crimes while her son was given 59 years. Frank's story, in some ways, shows the state of the clan today, not as prominent as it used to be, but still home to some shady characters. And while Frank tried to spread the clan's message, he missed the deadly threat lurking inside. The KKK is infamous as one of the biggest hate groups in the world and has been around for almost 200 years, so you can bet that it's been filled with some deadly people. From early founders who wanted to push its message to imperial wizards that organized attacks to those still promoting the KKK in the 21st century, our list has the worst of the worst. Want to find out more about the world's worst people? Click the card on your screen and start watching.